Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 448. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm Stephen Nall, and today is October 18th, the Feast of St. Luke the Physician. Okay, we'd like to welcome Stephen back to the program. Now, if you're... Let me mute my watch here one second, because... For some reason, every time I'm online, people want to talk to me. One second, one second, one second. And boom. This is the cool thing about Apple Watch. You can just go here and don't bother me. We'll see if it works. Uh, okay. For those who've watched the program for a long, long, long time, know that we've uh, interviewed Stephen. I think you and I first sat down when you were the uh, dean, principal in charge over at Uganda Christian University. You did a great interview. You talked about some of the, the, the struggles within the communion. We talked about Roland Williams, the Episcopal Church at the time. And I kind of got the indication talking to you way back when that things are not going to get better. This is just how the communion works with, you know, these broken structures. And um, you're right. It hasn't worked. Uh, we've had to set up uh, kind of parallel structures with GAFCON the Anglican Church in North America, and those are successful. They're taking off and working well. And I thought, you know, it's time to get you on the program again. I see you've written a book. I see it's free, which is in my price range, and I thought we could talk about it. First, how are you doing? Well, actually, I'm feeling fine. Uh, the last time I talked with you was the last day of GAFCON in Jerusalem. <laughs> you were uh, sick. I, I literally had had to leave the uh, statement group for the last hour to finish its work. I was so uh, afflicted, and I dragged myself through that interview and then slept for two days. So I did indeed need the help of St. Luke's physician, but uh, he was gracious, and now I'm feeling fine. That's good. That's good. Um, the topic, thanks to some uh, bishops over in England, of the day is the letter to the churches. GAFCON put out a letter to the churches uh, with GAFCON 3, kind of, you know, stating, you know, a future is available to us together or apart, you know, your choice. And it's interesting now, almost uh, how we're doing about four months later, to see a response to that uh, from the, the evangelical side of the, um, the Church of England. And I kind of see Welby's fingers in this. And I thought I'd sit down and talk to you about it because you know what, what happens above ground and below ground. Um, first, let's talk about um, your new book. Um, why do we need another book? Right. Well, you may know that earlier this year I actually published a collection of my writings called The Global Anglican Communion, which mm -hmm. is available at Anglican House. But that was before GAFCON in Jerusalem. and. So I thought after the GAFCON meeting, I should both make the text available and a commentary upon it. Let me tell you why I thought that was worth doing. I think that in our particular day, we've had three major dogmatic statements, which is pretty unusual for Anglicanism. I mean, once you get past the 39 articles and maybe the Lambeth quadrilateral, Anglicans are not known for their dogmatic statements, but in 1998, I believe that Lambeth Resolution 110 was a clear and concise statement of uh, Christian teaching on human sexuality, uh, very appropriate to that day and our day. Then again, in 2008, at the first uh, Global Anglican Future Conference, the conference came out with a statement uh, the Jerusalem Statement and Declaration, and now, ten years later, there was a further statement lettered to the churches. And in my view, these are all significant contributions to Anglican doctrine. And so, I actually wrote a, um, uh, a, a commentary on Lambeth 110. I wrote a commentary on the Jerusalem Statement. They're both in my book. And now I've written a commentary on the letter to the churches. So that's sort of the okay. Back so that explains um, why. What's the average reader going to get out of this? Well, first of all, I hope the average reader will simply read the letter, uh, the text itself. Uh, it's only twenty five hundred words, uh, uh, but it, um, I think, summarizes uh, where the Gafcon movement sees its calling, 
where it sees the Anglican Communion going and its particular role in it. So if nothing else, read the letter. Some people sometimes find it helpful to read a commentary before you read the Bible, but it's best always to read the Bible first. Then I will make this disclaimer. Um, I was a convener of this group, so I have some interesting insights and background on the letter and how it was written. But I am not an official of GAFCON. I'm a freelance uh, theologian, and so if you read the commentary, I hope you will feel that I have indeed interpreted the plain sense of the letter. But you can disagree, and others can disagree with me. Right after GAFCON, there was responses from the Church of England and, and Welby. Nobody's released the letters yet. Um, and it's interesting because he doesn't respond to the letter in any way, shape, or form. There, there's no official uh, Canterbury response to the, the uh, letter to the churches. That's correct. And, of course, that's consistent with his, with his overall policy, which is to pretend that Gafgon doesn't exist. Or right. at best, it's a ginger group of like-minded zealots uh, who really don't have anything to say uh, to the communion. Now, we do have a response yesterday from a, a group of evangelical bishops. What, what, what's your thoughts on their response? Yeah, well, I just read uh, their, uh, their letter today on, uh, you know, remaining uh, in the church. Um, and this is the, the second one. There are actually two letters, I think you know. The, the one was written uh, with regard to the uh, living, what do they call it, living in life or something uh, statement. The, the scary this, document, yes. <laughs> this one was written with regard to the, the global Anglican future. Well, I thought it was encouraging um, that they were actually addressing not only the concerns raised by GAFCON, but the letter itself. They obviously had read the letter. Of course, two of those bishops had been present at GAFCON. Uh, but clearly they believed that it was important to engage uh, with GAFCON. And so uh, that, I think, is a positive step. And would that the other powers that be actually listen to them. But I don't think they will. Uh, uh, and uh, so, nevertheless, perhaps this will open the door, which they seem to want, with discussions with the GAFCON leadership, with the GAFCON UK and the AMIE, and with the ACNA. Um, we can begin a conversation with those who do understand that we are preaching the same gospel um, and see how far we can go. But I really doubt that it'll have any effect uh, on the uh, powers that be in the Anglican Communion Office and, and Lambeth. Now, if, if you're really quiet, and you're over in England, you can hear a, a rumoring of maybe the way forward again is to look at an Anglican covenant. Something that if you want to be part of us, you sign on to, and if the Archbishop of Canterbury likes you enough, you can be part of group one. And uh, if you, you just want to be a partner member, you can be part of group two. And I, I'm hearing these rumors again. Um, and what always happens is we get to paragraph four. And yeah. for those who don't remember the original uh, uh, discussions of the covenant that happened in Jamaica and elsewhere, um, the, the first three paragraphs outline who is a, uh, in the communion, who's not. And the third one, or the fourth one, discusses what happens when you violate uh, the covenant. And it was, it was harsh in its original form. And there, there's a quick desire to water down the harshness. So there's just no way to get kicked out of the communion. And I'm imagining the, the future Anglican uh, covenant, if this goes this way, will have the same problem. Well, yes, Kevin, it, it happens that um, I know a little bit more about that. Because um, in July of this year, in other words, after the GAFCON uh, meeting in Jerusalem, uh, the Communion Office sent out uh, a set of uh, minutes from the Archbishop of Canterbury's Task Force on the Anglican Communion uh, from 2017 and 2018. And there were some revealing statements in these minutes. I'll read you just 
two snippets. From the first one, it said, we wish to be clear that those who break their communion with the Archbishop of Canterbury have placed themselves outside the Anglican communion. Now, my, my first question is, who is that? Who, who, who has who broken their communion? <laughs> well, I mean, I, to be honest with you, nobody in GAFCON that I know has placed themselves out, uh, broken their communion with the Archbishop of Canterbury. So he must be imagining someone else. So that was statement number one. But the, the second statement from 2018 was about promoting, reviving the Anglican Communion Covenant, sections one through three. But when they got to section four, the disciplinary section, here's what they said. Uh, section four should emphasize the positives of belonging and the means of walking together uh, without concentrating on punitive measures. Now, who could that be talking about? It's, <sighs> it, it sounds like that little Episcopal church that got its wrist slapped uh, in 2017. So three years after serving their sentence, uh, they will be welcomed back with open arms and everybody will walk together into the, the, the grand horizon, which is which is the Anglican future. That's the way I read it, anyway. Yeah, but the interesting, a, the interesting go, go thing he said was that these documents were sent out after the GAFCON meeting. In other words, after the communion establish, establishment had read the letter to the churches, had seen the requests that were made to Canterbury, and essentially ignored them and. It was business as usual. Push on ahead with the agenda. You and I have been doing this for a long time. You remember all the communiques um, from Tanzania, uh, to all the places, you know, the, the primates met. They put out these communiques calling for repentance within the Episcopal Church. That's clearly not going to happen under uh, the desires of Archbishop of Canterbury. But I'm struck remembering the last paragraph of the Windsor Report that, you know, kind of says there may be a time we have to walk apart, you know, right. after all these struggles. And we find that um, one province is just not playing along and is continuing to tear at the fabric of the communion. It's time to walk apart. That's never going to happen, is it? Well, I think it's interesting that in the, the letter that came from the evangelical bishops, they actually still use that language about tearing the fabric of the communion. And it's also mm -hmm. in the letter to the churches. But I don't hear that language coming out of Canterbury anymore. I think from their point of view, the wound has healed, the tear has been mended, and we just are going to go along uh, together um, with good disagreement. Okay, well, that sounds like fun. <laughs> However, I want to encourage people, and GAFCON is doing well. It, it's, it's a now a very mature, strong organization, um, setting up some really great structures together, trying to uh, work within the bylaws now of the provinces that are member provinces so that uh, an overturning of a, a primate doesn't have such a um, uh, tidal wave uh, of sorts. And that's interesting to watch. The ACNA doing very well, uh, uh, strong, uh, you know, well over uh, into its 10th year. So uh, I do want to encourage people that it all is not broken. Uh, just the old formularies just don't seem to work, Stephen. Well, actually, the really old formularies do work. That's the problem. Yes. <laughs> that, uh, you know, as I have mentioned in my various uh, commentaries, number one, the oldest formulary is called the Bible. Uh, and we start with what the Bible says about uh, all sorts of things, but, in, but especially about marriage and sexuality, we will not go astray. And even uh, the Church of England itself, you know, officially uh, in its uh, formulary, uh, Canon A5, which has been said a number of times, which is quoted in the Jerusalem uh, statement, uh, says, the doctrine of the Church of England is grounded in the Holy uh, Scriptures and in such teachings of the ancient fathers and councils of the church as are agreeable 
to the said scriptures. In particular, the doctrine is to be found in the 39 articles, Book of Common Prayer, and the Ordinal. That's the lead canon in the Church of England's identity statement. Uh, and if we were to follow that formulary, we would, in fact, be able to find our way through this morass of, uh, you know, uh, secular modernity. Hmm. Well, I want to thank you for your time, Stephen. And uh, I know we're going to be talking again because uh, there's going to be more letters forthcoming. You and I talked about some unreleased letters uh, that are something interesting. And hopefully one day some of those primates will release those letters so I don't get in trouble when I release them. <clears throat> hint, hint. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm Stephen Nall. And you've been hey, watching episode... Like What's that? Oh, well, I thought it was still the 18th, and we all need some healing from St. Luke the Physician.